So again, a virus injects itself and its genetic information into vulnerable cells and hijacks the cell, making the cell print out and do the things that it wants to do. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the movie Captain Phillips, right? When the dude is like, look at me, look at me. I'm the captain now. That's what happens when a virus comes along and injects itself into a vulnerable Tom Hanks cell. Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. I'm really excited about this episode. We've got a new setup here, and we're still remote. We're still guerrilla style. We're still doing this rogue from my place in Los Angeles. The building that my studio is in is still closed, and we've got some incredible stuff that we need to cover today. We thought we'd do this up a little bit different, get a new energy going. Can we use a new energy for 2020? And a lot has been going on the past week, week and a half. We launched a new documentary that has just taken off. About a million people have watched the documentary so far. And you can check it out right now. It's called Mask Facts, the science and history of mask and medicine. And you can check it out at themodelhealthshow.com forward slash mask facts. And also during this time frame, we just crossed our one year anniversary of being here in Los Angeles, transplanted from St. Louis, Missouri. Shout out to all my people in the Midwest. And it's just been an adventure. I'll put it like that. It's, it's been a roller coaster. It's been a more of a, not a roller coaster, but like, what is, you know that one where you like stick to the wall and you're like spinning around and it's just got kind of got you stuck. It's been kind of like that a little bit, a little roller, a little combination. All right, it's been a little Six Flags-ish in 2020 to say the least since we've been here in Los Angeles. But even in, within the last two weeks as well, we celebrated my 13th wedding anniversary and it's just the best decision I ever made. And by the way, she's one of the all-time best guests. We'll put one of her episodes, her most recent episode for you in the show notes. But uh, it's just been a great opportunity to spend time and to look back on what we've accomplished and what we've been through the past 13 years. We're 16 years together. And so we was like looking at pictures and things like that. And it just got me thinking about, we've got so many pictures that are in little envelopes that you get when you go and get your film developed at like Walgreens upstairs. And I think that we don't appreciate right now, especially kids, how much of a gift it is to be able to take pictures on your freaking phone. Just high definition, 4K. You could take 4K pictures on your phone. Back in the day, you got a disposable camera. You don't know what the hell those pictures are gonna look like when you get them back. You, you might be waiting for a whole bunch of blur. You know, you just don't know. And though, but those were the those were the olden days. Now we've got instant access to just about everything and we get a little spoiled and we forget the tough times that we had to go through to get here. But one of the best inventions, of course, back in the day was the Polaroid camera, right? The Polaroid camera, it just printed your photo out. It takes a little bit of time for it to to kind of evolve and become something you could see. And when I was a kid, we were taught to shake it, right? Shake it, shake it like a Polaroid pitch. But then we was probably actually messing the picture up, come to find out. But again, we've come a long way. And today, this is just alluding to the fact that we've come a long way in our understanding about some things and the, the, the situation that we're all dealing with right now with this pandemic. And today we're gonna dive a little bit deeper and cover some of the most essential aspects of how do we adjust? How do we move beyond this? And a big term that you really need to understand moving forward and for you to personally take this in and imbibe, but also in, to impress this upon your friends, your family and your community is this term called adaptive immunity. All right. So today we're going to be talking about immunological adaptation, viruses, immune cells, and how to practically support all of these systems. And again, I think you're going to get a lot out of this episode. We're going to have a great time. So be prepared to take some good notes, tune in, listen with your inner ear, and really uh, imbibe and take in a lot of this powerful information that every single person has the right to know. And with that said, 
you know, one of the crazy things that's happening right now is there's been a huge shift in online shopping, right? People just aren't getting out to the stores because a lot of stuff is shut down. There's so many regulations. You can only have a certain amount of people at the store at a certain time. You got to make sure that you have, you know, a, a certain type of mask. You got to make sure that you got, you know, gloves on, whatever it is. So people are just like, you know what? I'm just going to stay home. I'm going to order online. And one of the great opportunities that we have that a lot of people still don't know about is getting access to real, high quality, organic, non-GMO, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, keto friendly, whatever health label you subscribe to or that you are, are, are really passionate about, you can get access to the very best high quality foods that you'd find at a conventional health food store for 25 to 50% off the retail price that you'd be paying at your typical health food store. All online, they've been doing this way before the shift to online happened and just made a huge impact on how people do their shopping and also how we save. Right now, it's one of those times where more than ever, we need to be smart about our money. Over 40 million people that we know of right now are unemployed due to the economic shutdown. And many, many more people are just struggling to get by. So number one, it's about finding more creative ways as we move into the future of making income, but also being smart about saving our money as well. And so for me and my family for several years now, we've been a huge fan of Thrive Market because again, we get 25 to 50% off the products that we'd be buying anyways if we go to places like Whole Foods and other health food stores as well. And the reason we love Thrive Market is they have everything that you are looking for. Organic, non-GMO foods, clean beauty, safe supplements, non-toxic home products, you know, for cleaning, laundry, all those different things. They got sustainable seafood. They've got clean wines. They've got so many different things to choose from. All the best products curated from the best companies. Again, you get 25 to 50% off traditional retail prices. And also something that really makes them special is they look for ways to do good in the community. So right now, they've been invoking the Thrive Market COVID-19 Relief Fund, and they've been providing grocery stipends to families in need. And they've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. So when you buy from Thrive Market, a part of that goes to families in need, getting them high quality foods, people who are facing health challenges or hardships right now due to COVID-19, as well as uh, low income families and things of that nature they've been doing for a while. But right now, they've already raised over a half a million dollars to date to help support people who need it. Very special organization. You save money, you also are able to give to people who really need it. And some of my favorite things that we get from them all the time is the coconut oil. We get the big grande. Do we get the Ariana Grande coconut oil? Like you could put your head in it, okay? It's just a big tub of coconut oil. So cost effective. We save like, I don't even know, like probably $20 off of that much coconut oil that we get and chia seeds we get snacks for the kids we get our non-toxic personal care products so many great things do yourself a favor pop over to thrivemarket.com forward slash model health that's thrivemarket.com forward slash model health all together as one word and i gotta let you know this they've got different membership options but right now they're doing a very special bonus for folks who sign up for the one year thrive market membership Right now, you'll get to choose a free gift that's up to $22 in value when you join today. These gifts can range from foods to healthy home cleaning products to personal care products and more depending on when you take action to get your membership. Get your membership. Thrive Market is the bomb.com. Go to thrivemarket.com forward slash model health and get access to this incredible free bonus right now. Plus, again, save 25 to 50% off retail prices of all the goodies that you like. And on that note, let's get to the Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled, Thank You, by Allie PSI. Every time my inner and or outer life gets off balance, you put out content that brings me back. Your voice and knowledge serve as a powerful guiding force that is so incredibly rare. Thank you for the consistency and the reliability. Awesome. Thank you so much for leaving me that review over on Apple Podcasts. It means so much to me. And listen, if you've yet to do so, please pop over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show. I appreciate it immensely. And on that note, let's get to our topic of the day. Today, we're going to be talking about immunological adaptation, the nature of viruses, and the nature of how our immune system responds to viruses. 
And we're also going to be talking about very practical applications, clinically proven strategies for us to uh, support the function of our immune system in relationship to viruses. And some of this stuff is going to blow your mind. Now, unfortunately, a lot of us have been uh, not able to get access to an education about what we're dealing with right now. And there's one particular virus that's on a lot of people's minds, and we think that this is a rogue situation. But in reality, there's a much bigger story happening behind the scenes. And that's what we're going to dive into today. The first principle for us to understand, and it's kind of overwhelming to even grasp how big this is, but there are more viruses on our planet than literally anything else. There are more viruses than there are grains of sand. There's about 10 nonillion viruses or about 100 million times more viruses here on Earth than there are stars in the known universe. It is so beyond our comprehension how immersed we are in viruses. They're embedded within the, the waters of the oceans, the lakes, the streams, the rivers. They're embedded within the soil, within the air that we breathe. We literally cannot do anything without interacting with viruses. We're constantly inhaling and exhaling viruses all throughout the day. We cannot get away from them. We cannot hide. And there's a really intimate, complex relationship that we're gonna be diving into today as well. Now, something really freaky slash cool is that every single day, there are virus particles that are literally raining down on us from the atmosphere. And scientists recently discovered that within a three by three foot space here on Earth, it can be showered by nearly a billion viruses in a single day. What? Like, let that sink in a little bit. They're just raining down from the atmosphere within a three by three foot space, about a billion viruses every day. In a study that was actually published in the multidisciplinary journal of microbial ecology found that viruses are so efficient at traveling through the air that a virus can be swept up into the atmosphere on one continent and then be deposited on another continent. Crazy, crazy. This is why our interaction, this immersion, the fact that we can't get away from viruses, this is part of the reason why we have upwards of 400 trillion viruses inside of our bodies and on our bodies right now at this very moment. Each and every one of us, upwards of 400 trillion viruses. Now, it's nothing to be freaked out about. This is something that this is a natural relationship that we've evolved with. But today, again, viruses are on our minds, but we don't really understand the complex nature of our relationship dating back since the beginning of time, in, in particular, the beginning of human evolution. Now, what's also important to understand is that being that we have upwards of 400 trillion viruses in and on our bodies, we have to realize that some of these are actually pathogenic viruses that can in fact make us very ill, that can in fact actually kill us if our immune system is compromised. So again, right now, we all have pathogenic viruses in and on our bodies that can make us sick if our immune system get comp gets compromised. It's not always the case that we come in contact with a new bacteria or virus and then we catch a cold. A lot of times, things are just riding along with us, waiting for us to run ourselves to the ground with stress or to become sleep deprived or malnutrition or whatever the case it is that puts us in a compromised position with our immune system. And that's when the virus that's already present can take hold. Now, many of us, of course, have heard a lot about the microbiome the past few years. We've done a lot of different episodes talking about the topic. And there's been so many different published papers and, and researchers and scientists and physicians talking about how remarkable the microbiome is. And truly, in many aspects, it looks like the beginning the very root of human health actually starts in the gut. But what's so interesting about this phenomenon and understanding more about the microbiome, which again, this is a recent discovery. This is very recent that we started to even focus on this aspect of human health. Before it was just a throwaway topic, it didn't matter. People weren't thinking about this. But this is how quickly science changes. This is how things become obsolete 
when before we would just focus on miasmatic theory of disease, that disease is called by, caused by bad air. Then we got fully immersed in the germ theory of disease, and we're trying to kill all the germs, not realizing that we are mostly germs ourselves. Are we killing ourselves, trying to kill this, the germs? It's ironic, right? We have upwards of 10 times more bacteria than we have human cells. This is something that we know, and there's a symbiotic relationship there, but there's also pathogenic bacteria that we all carry that can get on top of your immune system and make you very sick if you become immunocompromised. So not only do we have the bacterial aspect of the microbiome, there's another emerging field that I'm really working, I've been talking about this since the very inception of the lockdown and COVID-19 and this kind of taking over the minds of the public at large. I've been talking about the human virome. This is our cascade or collection of viruses that we all carry. We all have a unique virome, which is again, a vast collection. Again, upwards of 400 trillion viruses that we all carry. And that is what makes up what's known as the human virome. Now, this human virome is just one aspect of how our relationship with viruses is such an intimate and complex and actually really amazing thing. But I've shared this before, but I really want us to get this today, that when the Human Genome Project was done and they mapped out the genetic code of humans, scientists were shocked to discover that approximately 8% of the human genome, the thing that makes us who we are, approximately 8% of the human genome is made of viruses. Endogenous retroviruses is what makes us human. And to dive a little bit deeper, many scientists believe that the transcription process that's used by viruses may have first caused DNA to be used as genetic material. Our DNA, the double helix, like this is the thing we found the code. Guess what? That code was created by viruses. So crazy, so crazy to understand. And to take this a step further, some of the most recent data shows that our cellular immune systems originate from and are spread by viruses. Data published in Frontiers in Microbiology, Virology, indicates that our immune systems likely evolve from simple viruses adapting against other viruses to eventually create the highly complex defense strategies that our bodies now have today. So the immune system that we have today that defends us from all manner of things, we have no idea that we're exposed to on a second by second basis is happening thanks to viruses. And, and just like bacteria have evolved to create something that is so important to our survival and our experience of energy, our energy power plants in our cells, many people know this now, is called our mitochondria. And our mitochondria have been well noted to be evolved from bacteria interacting with our human cells. That's what our, our mitochondria, the ancestor of our mitochondria that gives us the energy to live is a bacteria. All right. So just like that, bacteria have evolved to create our mitochondria. Viruses have evolved to create our immune system. And next up, I want to talk about, now that we understand some of the complex relationship, a little bit about the human virome, a little bit about our interaction, our evolution, human DNA evolving thanks to the activity of viruses, I want to talk about how viruses actually work. Now, one of the most important things to understand is that bacteria and viruses are very, very different. All right, bacteria, so first of all, the size of a bacteria, all right? The size of a bacteria is about, we'll say 1 40th the, size, the width of a human hair, all right? Tiny, teeny, 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 tiny uh, substance. Now, that's measured in micrometers. Viruses are so small, they're me measured in nanometers. This is like one billionth of a meter, all right? You could fit hundreds or even thousands of virus particles into a single bacteria. And many viruses actually do, they're called bacteriophages and they infect bacteria. And so number one, the size difference is crazy, but also bacteria are living things. They can replicate on their own. Viruses are 
kind of in between living and non-living. They have this biological capacity, but they need a host to do their job. All right, so they're not something that can replicate on their own. It's a very strange, freaky thing that I think a lot of zombie movies are derived from the action of viruses. Shout out to Night of the Living Dead. I should not have been watching that as a kid. But viruses actually work by latching onto specific cells in the host body, and they inject their genetic material into the vulnerable cells, keyword vulnerable cells, to infect them. And then a cascade of events is triggered, resulting in the merger of the virus with the cell. This merger allows the virus to release its genetic material and hijack the cell's internal machinery. And once this happens, the human cell is then turned into a factory that starts churning out new virus cells. So again, a virus injects itself and its genetic information into vulnerable cells and hijacks the cell, making the cell print out and do the things that it wants to do. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the movie Captain Phillips, right? When the dude is like, look at me, look at me. I'm the captain now. That's what happens when a virus comes along and injects itself into a vulnerable Tom Hanks cell. All right, shout out to Tom Hanks. Or maybe not, all right? I like every person. I love people. The one person that I could do without is Tom Hanks. I'm just going to confess it. And I was going to be like, oh, Tom Hanks is great. No, he's not. I rebel against Tom Hanks. All right. World Series, Cardinals, Red Sox. Tom Hanks was rooting for the Sox. I stopped liking him. I'm just kidding. He's awesome. I've seen all of his stuff. Road to Perdition. Who's seen Road to Perdition? All right. But he does do a lot of movies out on the water. I don't know what's up with that. All right. Anyways, so that's kind of what it's like. It's like getting hijacked. It's like pirates uh, of the Caribbean jumping in, taking over the cells and making the cell become a, a factory that prints out more viral infected cells. That's how viruses do the thing that they do. Now, fortunately, as it's designed to, the human immune system has several different ways to identify and to eradicate viral infected cells. So let's talk a little bit about how your body, how your immune system actually works in response to viruses. Your immune system has a vast array. It's a highly complex intelligent system. And one of the weapons at its disposal are cytotoxic T cells. Now cytotoxic T cells are actually circulating your system sort of like a police car on patrol. And what it's scanning for, if it notices a virus has blocked a receptor on a cell, it's kind of like cells have these receptors that are there to you know, connect with proteins, to connect to do behaviors. And a virus can attach and sit right there onto a cellular receptor. And these cytotoxic T cells are just patrolling like a police car. And if they notice, hey, there's a, a viral attaching to that receptor, it releases these cytotoxic factors to take out that uh, attempted uh, hijacker, that attempted uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto virus. So that's one weapon that's always scanning and patrolling via the immune system. Another immune factor is called your NK cells, our natural killer cells. Now, sometimes viruses actually try to hide. They're very crafty and they try to hide out and they cause a reduction in the active receptor sites on the cell. And natural killer cells function kind of like the FBI, sniffing out clues and seeing that the virus is trying to hide. And when they discover that, hey, this isn't adding up over here, this cell is not looking like the rest of these cells, it's not functioning normally, it puts a case together, and then it goes after the viral infected cells by releasing toxic substances that destroy the infected cells as well. So those are your NK cells. Another immunological weapon that we have are called interferons. Interferons are a group of signaling proteins made and released by your host cells in response to the presence of viruses. Now they're named interferons because of their ability to quote, interfere with viral replication and protecting nearby cells from viral infections. Now, these interferons are sort of like undercover agents. They're there working 
with the host cells. They're, they're kind of in the environment. They're keeping an eye out. And they're working to send signals and to interfere with any kind of wrongdoing that may take place. All right, so those are our interferons. Another weapon that we have within the context of our immune system are called antibodies. All right, antibodies. Now, some antibodies have this unique ability to actually stick to receptors on viruses, making them unable to attach to other cells. In essence, these antibodies work sort of like sticking a kick me sign on the back of a virus as it's trying to you know, do its thing. And your immune system comes along and just kicks the virus right in the pantalones for trying to do the thing that it's doing. So antibodies work by one way is they actually stick to receptors on viruses. And another way that antibodies work is they tag viruses and send macrophages to destroy them by eating them up like little Pac-Man. All right, so the, they're putting out signs, they're labeling things, they're like little informants. That's what antibodies are, they're like little informants. They're like, hey, you see that virus over there? You didn't hear this from me, but they're like that, okay? Now, we got antibodies, we've got cytotoxic T cells, we've got interferons, we've got NK cells. And also, and there's so much more, but one more thing that I wanna share with you in regards to our incredible immune system is we have what's known as your B cells, all right? Your B cells are responsible for what's known as humoral immunity. And humoral immunity produces antibodies that quote, remember an infection and stand ready in case your body should ever be exposed again. This is how your body, once you're infected or come in contact with a virus, the intelligence of your immune system to learn that virus and to remember how to handle that virus with speed is thanks to the reaction and the capabilities of your B cells, all right? So the, the B cells are kind of like advanced surveillance, all right? It's like the facial recognition that they're trying to do right now, but there, it's like that, very advanced surveillance technology that is always scanning and looking for uh, their target, okay? So really amazing, all these different capacities of the immune system, and this is just scratching the surface. There's so much more, but these are some of the basics that every single human being should know, just a foundational understanding of the incredible intelligence of our adaptive and innate immune systems. And a big key word that we're gonna move into now is the word adaption. If we look at human evolution, we can also say that this process of evolving has been our capacity to adapt to different circumstances, you know, within, within the environment, being able to adapt to different food sources, being able to adapt to different virus exposure and bacteria and all these different things. It's helped to evolve us as a species and our immune system has been adapting along the way as well. Now, right now, and this is just what we know, this is what we know sort of. There are approximately 320,000 types of viruses that infect mammals alone. 320,000 different viruses. This is just what we can estimate right now, all right? This is according to a study published in 2013 in the journal American Society for Microbiology. And another important question that we should be asking ourselves is, within the context of that 320,000 different viruses, how many viruses does scientists actually have some sound data on? And it would shock you how little we know. We know less than 1% of the viruses that there are, and we know less than 1% about them and how they function. So when we're leaning on the quote experts on this topic and the things that we're dealing with, I want everybody to grasp the magnitude of what we don't know. The very best expert will tell you, we actually don't know much. This is where my work is. We're working to, to create a, a, a catalog of information for future generations, but there is so much we don't know. Even the understanding of the human virome is this is so recent that we even understand this. But there are some reliable principles that we are very attuned to because again, if we look at human evolution, like we've been 
pretty good thus far in getting us to this place in response to all of the pathogenic viruses that we've been exposed to. And so I just want to drill a little bit deeper on that understanding. Now, in truth, we are the most dynamic and complex organism on the planet, and we are far more resilient than any virus if we're put toe to toe with them. We just continue to adapt and evolve. That's what we're designed to do. That's the, with, the, with the viruses that we've been exposed to that have integrated themselves into our DNA that's integrated themselves into the human genome have enabled us to do. And this is simply not talked about enough. And I just want to add some light and, and, and put a spotlight on this subject to help us to feel a little bit more empowered and have a better overall education and understanding about the situation we're dealing with, situations we've dealt with countless times in the past and situations that we're going to be dealing with countless times into the future. We have to get some semblance of understanding of the situation in our interaction. Another huge part of this conversation that's not being talked about enough, whether it's in major media, whether it's our health officials and politicians, is the fact that as of this recording today, about 17 million people have been infected, confirmed to be infected with COVID-19 who have not only survived, but a huge percentage of them didn't even know that they contracted the virus. Why are we not thinking about this? Why are we not highlighting this? And like, how did 17 million confirmed cases survive? And many of them didn't even know because they were asymptomatic. They didn't even have any symptoms. What happened? How were they able to do that? How can we encourage more of that? We don't have a ticker for how many people have recovered because the media is hyper-focused on the negative because they want you to stay in fear. They want you to stay focused on the negative and not to ignore that that thing happened, not to ignore that that thing is real, but we have to focus on the solution as well. And the solution thus far has not been presented. It's just been more of the same, worse and worse. It shifted from deaths. Once that number began to go down, then it just shifted to cases. And we're not talking about cases of recoveries. We're not talking about the 17 million people who are okay, that should be highlighted as well because that can get us into the real conversation, which is how are they okay? Because we know that this is the worst thing to happen in our lifetime. Yes, there's nowhere near the pandemic, you know, the 1918, when we're talking about 20, 30 million lives lost. It's not that, but it's still, this is something that we've shut our entire economy down for. Our social structures have been turned upside down economic structures, and also our health. And it's highlighting how vulnerable we are as a society. You know, when we have infectious diseases that go around all the time, this is a novel disease. And in the beginning, we were told that we don't have an innate immunity, but we're not talking about our adaptive immunity. And the truth is, for these 17 million people, did they get access to some kind of secret vaccine we didn't know about? Did they get hydroxychloroquine in the waters where they're from? No, this is all over the world. We have these cases. And the reason that 17 million people are okay, and again, a huge percentage of them not even knowing that they contracted the virus because they didn't even have any symptoms, they didn't even know that they were supposed to be sick, is because of something called adaptation. It's because of the adaptive immune system, being exposed to what's new, which the point of building up to this conversation today is, is telling you how many new viruses you are exposed to every single day of your life, many of them pathogenic, but it's when our immune systems are compromised that we have this experience of getting sick. Now, this one is very contagious. This is something that we're hyper-focused on. But the solution lies within this context because even when we say 17 million cases, we have to realize too, and we talked about this with Dr. Alan Preston, epidemiologist, but also on the ground uh, work for years, working with governors and states to work and create their healthcare structures. And just like he's got so many, uh, such a variety of experience. And he shared that in the world of epidemiology, we know as a basic tenet that when we have a number of confirmed cases, on average, we're looking at there's probably 10 times more cases than what's confirmed. So 10 times, potentially, that's 17 million. 
why are all those people okay? Why have all of those people adapted? What is adaptation? What does that look like? And we already went through and talked about the, the incredible nature of how our immune system functions and how viruses function. It's a, just a miraculous process. And it's happening. This is like this invisible world, this invisible battle, this invisible uh, thriving community taking place within our bodies, within our world all the time. It's just so remarkable to think about. We're like, it's so, we can't even wrap our minds around it. Some of the numbers that I shared today, it's so hard for us to fathom. You know, nine, nine million, 10, nine, 100, nine, nine million, 10, nine million. What the heck is a nine million? I first heard nine million from my son from Roblox. He's got all these Roblox bucks. Like, what is, that's how many viruses there are in our planet. 100 times more than all the stars in the known universe. The known universe is freaking, that'll freak you out in of itself. But it's just a lot to fathom. But it's, uh, again, going back to how, does, how do people adapt? What's happening right now? Is this an adaptive process? Is this calling out a, 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 a very strong uh, gap in our healthcare system that's not being taken care of? And this is something we can sure up and it's giving us an opportunity to save lives and we're not taking advantage of it. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So number one, and going back to our conversation about natural killer cells, first of all, they have the best name of any immune system weapon is the natural killer cells. You're not a, just a trained killer, you're natural at it. Natural killer cells. A brand new study published in the peer reviewed journal, Medical Hypothesis found that on average, People with low natural killer cell counts have much higher rates of severe infections from COVID-19. Oh my goodness. Feel me. You got to feel me on this one. Why are we not talking about this? Why? It's right there. Our natural killer cells are so effective at killing COVID infected cells that many pharmaceutical companies right now are scrambling to create vaccines that specifically manipulate your natural killer cells as a cure for COVID-19. That's what they're, they're targeting right now to create vaccines to do the thing your body does already when it's in a healthy state. In fact, the FDA has actually already cleared an experimental new drug for natural killer cell based COVID-19 therapy. They fast, quote, fast tracked it. It's fast tracked. But as usual, our conventional system that allows millions of people to die every single year from preventable illnesses, they're looking at this through the lens of pharmacology and not how the human body actually functions, how health actually works, and the fact that you can suppress the production of your natural killer cells within a day. And you could improve the production and performance of your natural killer cells within a day. But we're gonna wait, we gotta wait for the drug to come. It's not looking at how things actually work in the real world. And the truth is, at the end of the day, many of the things that I'm about to share are accessible to all of us right now. They don't require anything but a little bit of focus. Oftentimes they don't require you to Go get a prescription. All right. It's in the prescription. That's from uh, Chris Tucker stand up Netflix. Check it out. It's very funny. Basically, his dad had a health condition. Chris Tucker. Shout out to Chris Tucker. Friday fame. Money talks. Rush hour. One, two and three. All right. Chris Tucker. That Chris Tucker. But his dad, I guess he has some kind of health issue. And he was like, Chris, I, the doctor's saying I need to get a new car. Cause Chris got the money, you know, Chris got the money, but he's like, it's in the prescription. You know, they're saying the doctor wrote a note, like you need a new car. So you could, you know, cause of your back or whatever it is. Anyways, it's in the prescription. You don't need a prescription to do what I'm about to share to enhance, support the production of your natural killer cells, which is right. As of now, this is the thing that they're targeting. They found this to be so effective because they're not just regular killers. They're natural. A study conducted by researchers at Appalachian State University found that simply going for a short walk 
immediately boosts immune cell parameters, most notably for our intents and purposes, boosting the production of your natural killer blood cell counts. Also notable in their study was the neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, and more immune improvements as well. What are we not doing right now? The images, seeing New York City empty, the streets of New York City empty, but of course the social distancing mandates were in place to help to slow the spread, right? But if we take this to an extreme and we give ourselves a permission slip to not do anything, or we give ourselves uh, a mental imprisonment where we create such a level of fear that we don't even get out and move our body. Please believe that it's happened for millions of people right now. That might not be you, but millions of people are now who would, even if they're just being active just to get to work, are not doing that right now. And you wonder why we're seeing such an uptick in other issues, not related specifically to getting sick from a virus, but mental health challenges with depression, with anxiety, these numbers have skyrocketed. And these are things that we're gonna be talking a lot more about because we are in a situation where the treatment for this issue with COVID-19 can be potentially far worse and far reaching than the actual issue we're trying to address itself. So, but just to keep this in our back pocket, we have to know this, we have to encourage this within our families and our structure and our communities. We need to walk, we need to move. Your genes expect you to move. Your genes do all kinds of cool things to support your health and well-being when you walk. It's a thing that we're designed to do more than anything else is to walk. We need it. So figuring out a creative way for yourself. This, might, this doesn't have to necessarily be walking. If you literally like, I'm not going out there, I'm not going outside, throw on, a, throw on some payo. Shout out to Shalene Johnson. Throw on some, you know, Sean T. Or just, you know, walk. I'm, I'm sure there's like walking DVDs, sweating to the oldies. Richard Simmons, get out the short shorts. You got to move your body. You're going to produce more natural killer cells. That's the most important thing for our immune system right now. The data is already there. You can do, your body does it. It just needs the initiation. You have to be doing things that a normal human would do for your body to respond in the way to an infection that a normal human would respond, that a normal immune system would respond. And right now we know that the vast majority, 80 to upwards of 90% of the folks who've had severe reactions, or even if we're looking at the mortality of COVID-19, were folks who had immunosuppression due to a chronic illness. The top three being hypertension, type two diabetes, and obesity with their immune system being suppressed already and some of the other things that we're going to talk about we have to focus on this nobody's talking about this stuff and the people that are are being censored which is the craziest thing this is just science and this needs to be a part of the conversation it makes you think that they never wanted to talk about that stuff in the first place they just say hey stay in your house wear a mask end of story this will go away eventually wait for a vaccine to come we can't do that, guys. We have to be better than that. We're better than that. We can employ some of those things, sure, but we have to remove the underlying cause because these individuals that are susceptible are going to continue to be susceptible. If it's us, we have to get ourselves healthy. Nobody else can do it for us. We have to do it now. If we've learned anything from this situation, we have to get ourselves and our communities healthy. That is the order of the day. If we let this time pass, we're gonna end up in some like Wally, if you've seen the, the movie Wally, we're going to end up in some Wally type world. I'm telling you. All right, that's that Wally boy. You know, I could do that. But we be aware. This is the time. We get to decide how the future is going to look. Now, even within the context of improving the NK cells through walking, through movement, the performance of another, a major regulatory system of your immune system, which is your lymphatic system, 
is dramatically improved through exercise as well. A study published in the journal Sports Medicine cited that during steady state exercise like walking, lymph flow has been shown to increase to levels approximately two to three fold higher than at rest. Your lymphatic system is moving around a lot of your immune cells and getting rid of dealing with a lot of waste. Like I, I liken our lymphatic system to you kind of in, internal cellular waste management system, but it doesn't move unless you move. It's not like your circulatory system that just kind of moves even when you're doing nothing. Your lymphatic system requires movement in order for it to move. And so when you're stagnant, when you're not moving around, it's like your pipes getting clogged up and all kinds of nastiness can start to happen. All kinds of problems with your immune system. So just another call to action. So what do we do? How do we employ this? I've made it famous. Learn why you burn. Learn why you burn. Should have been had some swag with that on there. And shout out to everybody that posts the learn why you burn. I see you guys. Um, but this can be a time where you throw on a podcast and go move your body. Go out and walk, go exercise, listen to a podcast, audio book. Um, this can be a time where, you know, even if you got the setup, like you got the fancy setup, you got the TV, you could watch a, you know, a lecture, you could attend a class, learn why you burn, make the time valuable, make the time valuable. This can be another time where you, even with the walk, you can up the ante, you know, like you're trying to like compound, add some, throw on a weighted vest. All right. Throw on a weighted vest. I don't think it's a good idea necessarily to put on like weird shoes and stuff like that to go and walk with. I remember playing basketball with my friend Jeff. Shout out to Jeff. He's owner of an epic, incredible fitness company and gym right now. Who knew? We grew up on the same block, you know, and uh, we would always play sports together. He's the first person to take me to a gym. You know, it was such a cool experience. I have weights that I got from Jeff that I bought from him when I was 15 years old in my backyard right now. That's some good ass weights. Let's just be honest. I don't make them like that anymore. But Jeff would, when we would play basketball, he would wear these like jump shoes. It was like shoes that just had, it had like a platform in the front of the toe of the shoe. It was like a little lily pad and then like a little pole that reached up to the tip of the shoe. I know this is sounding really weird to try to explain, but I guess it was supposed to give him ups, you know, help him to jump higher, you know, white men can't jump kind of thing, you know. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if it ever worked out for him. And he would ball out in those shoes. It was so crazy. But I wonder what that did to maybe that's why he got into the fitness that he's into now. Right. He's like functional, whatever. Maybe he messed himself up with the jump shoes. I never asked him. But I don't think it's necessary to do anything like that. You know, he went from like maximalist shoes where he's got like the thick, super like triple decker layer bottom shoes. So they get the minimalist shoes. I don't care. Just go walk. You don't got to do anything special. Just go walk. Um, so you can up the ante. You know, you could add a weighted vest. You could, you know, maybe carry some stuff, do some farmer, farmer carries. You can make it social. This is something I personally love. Take my my son, my youngest son, just go for a little walk and adventure. He brings a sword. He brings a sword with him. OK, it's not like it's plastic. OK, but he does. And it just it is what it is. That's how he goes for his walk. Um, or, you know, somebody, you know, your, your significant other, it's going to be a time to connect and, and, and both get the benefits of enhancing your immune function. All right. So those are some tangible things there. Next up, we're going to talk about another huge aspect of our immune function that is massively overlooked. And what I'm about to share should be incredibly eye opening for you. Now, as far as I know, back in March, we were the first a show with a major platform to kind of dissect and talk about like what the heck does this mean coronavirus COVID-19 and you know breaking down those acronyms because it's an acronym and I had several people message me even physicians like I didn't even know what the heck I didn't know it was an acronym so CO in COVID-19 so the CO is coronavirus is a category of family of viruses I wonder if if they have like family disputes anyways then you got VI, virus. You've got the D, disease. So Corona, virus, disease, 19. It's the year that it came out, right? It's like when that, you know, that, that Tupac dropped after he was gone, the Machiavelli, when that came out, 
you know, was that 96, 97? Come on. You remember that year. So that's the that's COVID-19. But we know what it stands for. But what is it? What is COVID-19? COVID-19 is labeled as a hyperinflammatory condition that usually affects the lungs. That's how it's defined. The Journal of Medical Virology states that the pathophysiological hallmark of COVID-19 is severe inflammation. There's that word. Inflammation can sound like it's some ghost. It's a flamey ghost. It's a ghost. It's a ghost flame. This is a real thing. It's a real phenomenon. And it's a, it's a natural part of human functioning. But when there's excessive inflammation, as is turned hyperinflammation or hyperinflammatory condition, we can get into a whole lot of problems. The inflammation, this is very important. The inflammation is not from the virus itself. Please hear this. The inflammation is not from the virus itself. The inflammation is what your body creates. Your body is making the inflammation that gives us the symptoms in response to trying to eliminate the virus. And those who have pre-existing chronic illnesses already have heightened or excessive levels of inflammation in their body. These conditions that we've already noted, obesity, hypertension, type two diabetes, they have massive inflammatory components to all of them. So we already, we're looking at an inflamed human being, an inflamed system. And of course, we've got biomarkers we could check for these things, C-reactive protein and more, which we'll talk about one of these in a moment. But just please understand, pre-inflamed individual meets hyperinflammation virus, hyper, hyperinflammation triggering virus. What do you think's gonna happen? Now, there is a natural inflammatory response, but if your body is already struggling with systemic inflammation, a novel virus, a flu, these things become exceedingly dangerous. This is not complicated stuff, but we're not addressing the underlying inflammation that people are experiencing in the first place. Why would we not do that? It's been like six months now. Do you know how much we could have helped people to transform their health in our society? And you know what I've heard from so many health professionals? We just can't get people healthy that quickly. And these are people who are health professionals using that as an excuse. When they're hyper-focused on masks, and I'm hyper-focused on, let's actually address the underlying issue. But we can't get people healthy that, that quickly. You need to get out of this field because that's unequivocally untrue. And I can understand if this was like the first two weeks, maybe. But about six months later now, and the conversation sh still hasn't shifted, they never wanted it to shift in the first place because that's not what they do. They don't eliminate the underlying cause. They use pharmacology to treat symptoms. I've been talking about this for years. I've been in this field for 18 years. And you might see me right now in the video like, you look so young. And I'm like, yeah, because I do the stuff I say. But real talk, it's been, almost a, it's been almost two decades that I've been in this space. Over 10 years clinical work, this is what I do. And this is the time it matters more than ever. And I'm going to continue to speak up because we can actually save lives. And we can prevent future problems if we fix the underlying cause of a sick society that has a governmental, economic, social structure that encourages people to be sick. It encourages chronic disease. Speak up right now because that's what the real problem is. They're not trying to fix that. As I digress, as I digress, yet another critical aspect of the immune system that we all need to know about right now is the role of interleukin-6, all right, interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 plays a major role in managing the inflammatory response of your immune system, all right? It's a driver of inflammation. And when it's doing its job right, it'll employ an appropriate amount of inflammation to take care of the problem. If it's not doing its job right, things can get 
fugly pretty quickly. I hope you know fugly is a blend. All right. Now, right now, interleukin-6 is a leading target by scientists and pharmaceutical companies in the battle against COVID-19. This is something else they're targeting. This is something else that our bodies, right now, we don't have to wait. We can manage, we can address. But funny enough, this starts with another important understanding that we're gonna, we're gonna circle back to interleukin-6, but you've gotta understand this research is published in the Journal of Transitional Immunology, which affirms that over 70% of our entire immune system is located in our gut. Now, that for me, that just makes sense because it's a primary contact point for the world. Like when we eat or we bring things into our body proactively, like this is the most intimate thing in our universe. Like we're proactively taking something from out there and putting it in here. You would think that this would be the front line, you know, just from a logical place. But again, we generally don't operate on logic when we're talking about conventional medicine's approach to things like this. So your immune system's in many aspects, kind of a central hub or central command is this gut brain axis. And also primarily you've got a big hub of your immune system's command in your gut itself. And here's the thing. We've got sound data on this right now. Please hear this again. The majority of your immune system is located in your gut. Your immune system, for the 17 million people who've already been confirmed to get the infection and to be fine, to be okay, to have adapted to the infection, their immune system, the vast majority of it is located in their gut. And you can shift the bacterial cascade of your microbiome within 24 hours in both positive and negative ways. This is already clear in the data. Now you do have kind of like a gut environment set point that even if you shift is going to have a tendency to pull you back to where your set point is, kind of like a thermostat that makes it easier for friendly microbes or not so friendly microbes in that cascade to stay at a certain place. So it it can take more time, obviously, than 24 hours. But within 24 hours, we can see some pretty significant changes in the microbiome, the hub of your immune system. So when these small-minded folks, unfortunately, maybe they got huge minds, but small minds in this aspect are saying that we cannot make major changes for people that quickly. We can't get people healthier that fast. We can't improve people's immune system overnight, or we can't improve people's immune system that quickly. It's been six months. When are we going to start? The response, and I, this is important. Now we're getting just like boots on the ground. Here's some real, what can shift our immune system and our gut microbiome in a negative way? The response to a specific substance that has become massively just infiltrated our culture, infiltrated our society, our communities, the response to this particular substance has damaged our gut microbiome and our immune system more than just about anything. And this is gonna be highlighted in a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition uncovered that one of the ways that the consumption of sugar suppresses the immune system is by directly decreasing the capacity of neutrophils to engulf pathogenic bacteria. So suppressing the ability of these cells that go and gobble up pathogens, they go and eat them. They're delicious to them. It suppresses those particular cells from being able to do their jobs when you consume sugar. Unfortunately, this is another one of those things that's out there is debunked. The headlines, sugar does not suppress your immune system when people, you know, Healthcare professionals who are in this space operating with integrity, they're like, hey, listen, we have this infectious disease going around. You really need to take a look at managing your sugar because it can suppress or damage your immune system. And there's like, and then the, then the reports come out. And I, I got one right here. Now, this headline is from a major website. And the headline says, too much sugar won't directly weaken your immune system.
It goes on one of the bullet points. There is no scientific evidence to suggest that consuming too much sugar will directly weaken your immune system. I just read a study. I just read one. It wasn't hard to find. And the funny thing is they mentioned the study, but then they said, let me go and tell you what it said. It's so funny. They said that the study's results have yet to be replicated. Yet to be replicated. So number one, we have a study affirming that this happens. When it says yet to be replicated, that's inferring that other studies have been done that didn't replicate the same results. The truth is no studies have been done at all to look at this issue since then according to popular data. But there's other dynamics here that we're not looking at. So number one, again, I, I'm really, I've kind of had it up to here with these debunking, but they're not actually looking at the data or they're misconstruing it. And the, the thing is, the data is right there. And so what was uncovered in this study was again, it inhibits the capacity of immune cells to eliminate pathogenic organisms and sources in particular in the study they looked at refined sugar high fructose corn syrup and pasteurized orange juice which is just liquid sugar and what they noted was that the greatest effects of suppression with the immune system occurred within one to two hours after consuming the sugar but the values were significantly depressed for up to five hours after the consumption now again this is a study on the subject but the unfortunate thing is that this is just not looking at the basics because I can hit this from multiple angles. It's not just the direct impact of the sugar in the gut. It's also the basics of how sugar affects the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It's the basics on how sugar impacts your cortisol levels, which your HPA axis manages your immune system as well. And we know that there's going to be a cortisol response, a hyper response, especially when you consume, just say today, you know, again, sweetened beverages are a massive issue in our culture. Just one sweetened beverage, you're going to have a, a responding crash. You're going to have that hypoglycemic issue and cortisol is going to be produced and released in massive quantities because for your body, that blood sugar swing is a threat. Like that low blood sugar, it has to respond in force to bring your blood sugar back up to normal. So cortisol is released to literally even, you know, this gluconeogenesis process of like, of even getting sugar out of your valuable lean muscle tissue and tearing your muscle tissue down and turning to sugar because it's so important as a survival mechanism. All right. So scientists at Carnegie Mellon University found that abnormal stress response like this directly causes suppressed immune function. This was not hard for me. This is light work, but then the headlines are this and it's just not true. It's absolutely true. And also what does the sugar do when we're talking about the major causes, the number one risk factor for death associated with COVID-19, hypertension, does sugar affect that? Hell yeah. That's a Dr. Dre, hell yeah, okay? Sugar, does it affect type two diabetes? Hell yeah. Sugar, does it affect obesity? Hell yeah, all right? <laughs> it affects all those things dramatically. In fact, a case could be made, the, probably the most firm case of all this stuff, to be the most causative dietary factor of all of those health issues. <sighs> Feeling like it's Dre Day right now. Now, how much sugar does the average American eat? The average American consumes about 70 pounds of added sugars. So that's just added. That's added. That's extra sugar. 70 pounds in a year. 70 pounds. That's like a whole seventh grader. But overall, the average American consumes 150 pounds of total sugar in a year. Do you think we have a problem? A century ago, it was a couple pounds. And we're going to go from 
a, a couple pounds to 150 pounds, we're not the same species anymore. We're not even the same thing. Hopefully at this point, you're seeing that it's not hard to see the connection here between, you know, again, 80 to 90 percent of the folks with deaths relating to COVID-19 here in the United States were folks who had a lifestyle related chronic disease, the majority of them being diet related with the top three COVID comorbidities being obesity, hypertension, type two diabetes. Can we address the underlying cause? Can we please? Can we please? These things are inherent with immunosuppression, inflammation. And when you have those things and exposure to any infectious disease, the outcomes begin to get very sketchy. How do we fix this? What are some of the basic things we could do? Because we're just doing basics. We're just, we're just doing basics because that's what we need right now. A meta-analysis of 83 studies published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that higher intakes of fruits and vegetables lead to both a reduction in pro-inflammatory biomarkers and an enhanced immune cell profile. Fruits and vegetables! Where are they in this conversation? Mask! Fruits and vegetables. Mask! Fruits and vegetables. Mask! Fruits and vegetables. Mask! Fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables. Where's our attention? This has proof. Real world proof. But we're going to take it because it is the model health show. We're going to take it just a little further. Then we got the basics, but we're going to go a little bit to the supers. A study published in the journal Current Pharmaceutical Design revealed that the compounds in turmeric have a massive impact on down-regulating interleukin-6 that manages inflammation, that when interleukin-6 is off, that pro-inflammatory state is encouraged. This specific, this is what's being targeted right now by scientists for treatment of COVID-19 is interleukin-6. Turmeric. This is a peer-reviewed journal that's for the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, this, this works. Turmeric has a massive impact on down-regulating interleukin-6 and inhibition of interleukin-6 signaling with therapeutic effects. That's what the study found. Mm, this is not that difficult. For me, this is something I have pretty much daily and I even travel with it, but I've got a daily turmeric supplement. It's like a super critical extract. You could just get it out of your cabinet and add it to your food. But if you want to like really get these kind of therapeutic doses that you see in studies like this and the really dense um, array of other cofactors, in addition to the curcumin that's highlighted in this study, getting like a super critical extract is an awesome idea. It's amazing for just inflammation, period. But if we're addressing inflammation for this specific issue, this is one of the things that can do it. We've got real world data to affirm that. There's so many others, but this is one of the best. It's got the most data. There's, there's so many studies on the effectiveness of curcumin and turmeric. But again, what about all the cofactors in the turmeric? And another thing that's a biopotentiator, which is black pepper, funny enough, is in the daily turmeric supplement that I take. It's from Organifi. I highly recommend you get some just to have in your superhero utility belt. Uh, it's Organifi.com forward slash model. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash model. The Daily turmeric. If you're interested in interleukin-6 and all that activity and reducing inflammation, as we've already talked about, just the basics, fruits and vegetables. But if we want to add in little things here and there, We've got stuff to do that, all right? Daily turmeric. Now, how else can we address our defenses through nutrition when we're talking about COVID-19? Another study that was published in the BMJ found that the risk of ending up in the ICU due to COVID-19 goes up 20-fold higher 
when you're deficient in vitamin D. Vitamin D, again, it's right here. It's responsible for so many things in the human body. But we know there's a direct correlation that is substantial, 20-fold greater risk of ending up in the ICU, of course, than the greater risk of mortality as well. And a special note here, African-Americans are noted to specifically be at greater risk for vitamin D deficiency because of the melanin. Because of the melanin. It's like built-in sunscreen. You need more time in the sun and or right now is a good time to supplement. And just make sure you get a vitamin D3 supplement. No crazy fillers, binders, none of that. Just vitamin D supplement. There's so many different companies that have them. It's another thing to add to your superhero utility belt. Again, there's so many different things. I'll share one more. Research published in the journal Innate Immunity. What a great name. Best name journal right now. They should get the award for this time. Research published in the journal Innate Immunity found that reishi, the medicinal mushroom reishi, Ganoderma, reishi is able to directly improve natural killer cell cytotoxicity. Again, these aren't just average killers. These are natural killers. And reishi has been found to directly improve natural killer cell cytotoxicity. Isn't this something important to know? And we all, we have access to this. Plus the benefits that reishi has clinically proven on sleep and reducing stress and the list goes on and on. This is something, this is part of my nightly routine to have a cup of reishi tea. And my son, Brayden, his, this is his jam now. We get this little Rishi hot cocoa from Four Sigmatic and he has in the morning. My wife and I in the mornings, you know, we'll have our, our mushroom coffees and my son Braden is having his mushroom hot cocoa. It's a whole vibe. It's a whole vibe. And it's a Rishi hot cocoa. I'm just finding creative ways to get the good stuff in his body. This is why I love what Four Sigmatic does because they're taking a behavior we already do and just upgrading it and adding these things in that have all these proven benefits. So if we're really looking at Improving the function of our natural killer cells, another thing to look to is Rishi, all right? And for that one, it's foursigmatic.com forward slash model for 15% off. And again, they've got Rishi Elixir, they've got Lion's Mane, they've got Mushroom Coffees, Mushroom Hot Cocos, organic, high quality, best source, dual extracted, so you actually get the benefit. When you hear something like this, you hear a study like this, you're, you don't know, is it a hot water extract? Is it an alcohol extract? Am I getting the triterpenes? Is it the beta glucans is doing this? You get all of the benefits of the medicinal mushroom when you get Four Sigmatic pro uh, products because they do a dual extraction. All right, so it's foursigmatic.com forward slash model for 15% off. All right, last thing I want to cover with you today. There's so much more, so much more, but I think that this is one of the most important things that's being overlooked right now. And this is the impact that stress has on our immune response. A study published in the peer-reviewed journal Stress and Health found a significant correlation between the capacity of individuals to cope with daily life stress and their NK cell activity. In the study, folks who didn't cope well with stress were found to have significantly lower natural killer cell activity. Research published in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences described how the chronic release of stress hormones can create what's known as, what's known as an allostatic load. And this is a form of physiological wear and tear, producing immune system dysfunction and suppression from stress, from stress. Do you think our society is more stress or less stress? when COVID came a knocking. This is suppressing our immune system even more. And we have to do things to address this. We have to take control of our health right now and address this. Another part of the study found that chronic stress impairs the immune system response as well as triggering inflammation. Stress triggers inflammation in your body. Make the connection. And they also noted that negative emotions can also have suppressive impacts on the immune system and they can also shorten our telomeres so our telomeres are a biological marker determining how long we're going to live we're not even going to get into that back right now but just understand stress increases inflammation 
suppresses the immune system. What are some solutions? Well, they were actually looking at, when we think of stress today, I think that a lot of us think of meditation or we think of massage therapy or something like that before. A lot of people, when you think about stress management, when you hear that, it's like, oh, you need to meditate. But are we doing it? And also, are we, have we found the flavor? Have we found something that actually matches us, that feels good, that we enjoy doing, that we want to have as a part of our life? Have we seen the benefits from meditation? And so for that, we have to understand that the mind-body, like it's multi-directional, it's, it's really bi-directional. Your thoughts affect your body, and what you do with your body affects your thoughts. And the stress reduction capacity of a meditation practice has been found to, number one, and this is right here in the data, this was a study published in OBM, Integrative and Complementary Medicine, demonstrated that different forms of meditation result in an increase in natural killer cells. Increases your natural killer cells through meditation. It's like you're doing, it's like a dojo, you're training these natural killers. Now they're already natural killers. Now they're trained natural killers to be even better at their job. They also found that meditation results in an increase in your B cells, which is associated with your humoral immune system, which is responsible for remembering an infection that you were exposed to so it never bothers you again. It's kind of like when those automated telemarketer calls come to your phone and you're like, put me on your no call list. So it never bothers you again. Meditation can help to encourage the performance of your humoral immune system so that your immune system literally learns from its experience and it becomes more adaptive, right? We have an innate immune system and an adaptive immune system. And both of these things need to be a huge topic of conversation today. Another big way to manage and modulate our stress to address this is shown in data published in the journal Psychoneuroendocrinology that found that sleep deprivation directly reduces the production and performance of your natural killer cells. This is one of the biggest primary ways to support our body's appropriate stress response is sleep. And there's so many components. We've had many episodes talking about this and how sleep relates to uh, your HPA access and stress modulation, your immune system, and more. But these are things to employ right now. Are we doing it? For many of us, our structure and our schedules are all over the place. But here's the time to really employ some very simple, clinically proven practices to improve our sleep health. Employ some meditation. Get an app. Get a guided meditation. Take an online class to learn meditation. Or learn Tai Chi. You can take a Tai Chi course. I got one for you. I'm actually going to put in the show notes for you an interview that I did with an absolute superstar in Qigong, all right? It's some mystical, like, movements in the forest, like Bambi coming up to you, eating from your hand kind of vibe that gets created, all right? But I'll put that for you in the show notes. It was a good friend of mine, Tristan Truscott, and just awesome. There's so many things that we have access to, so I'll put that interview for you in the show notes. It was back in the day. We got so much good stuff here for you to immerse your mind in because it's a bi-directional experience. Your mind right now, your thoughts create chemistry in your body. Your mind is a huge player in how you're going to experience this dramatic shift that's taking place in the world. We need to take control of our mind. We need to take control of our physical health. We need to take control of our relationships the best that we can. It's all new for us. But... The real mission for many of us right now is to focus on things that we can do. There's so much that's out of our control, but what you can control is what you do with your own mind and what you immerse yourself in. So we've got an incredible catalog of episodes for you that are right there at your fingertips. I've got your back to keep you in a good headspace to help you to feel empowered. And more importantly, we're just getting warmed up. There's so much more to come. I hope that you got a lot of value out of this episode. These things need to be known by everybody. So please share this out with your friends and family on social media. Of course, you could tag me. Share this out with your family. You could just send it right through the podcast app. Text them. Text them the episode. Say, hey, check this out. This is re really important information right now to help to manage what's going on. Let's get our friends and family and our communities educated and keep building. All right. I appreciate you so much for tuning into the show today. Take care. Have an amazing day. And I'll talk with you soon.
Shortly after I became a neurologist, I began having um, migraine headaches, which I was like, no problem, I'm a neurologist. Um, I can tackle this. And I went through one medication after the next, after the next, and um, either the side effects were awful or they just weren't working. And so after a year of trying that, I again went back to my mom <laughs> and said, 